thought I was going to have to call her down. She's fixing to start preaching on me. Anyway, there's nothing worse than those preachers that can sing and preach. So that's, those guys, they make me sick. Um, John chapter 6 is where we're going to be. John chapter 6. And um, as, we, as you're getting there, of course, when I came through this passage, I was like, man, we got to do communion. So the multitudes are running into Christ, they're following Christ, they're encountering the Master, and they're looking for Him everywhere He goes. He can't get away from them. He just got through feeding the 5,000, and that's the men, not counting the women and the children like we talked about. And the multitude now is starting to turn away from Jesus, like we do today. So that's where we are. The question was asked in our text, to whom shall we go? So if you can and will, for John chapter 6, 68, if you'll stand with me, if at all possible. So the Bible says, for the respect of God's word, Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Father God, I pray, Lord, that we will see that there is no other path. There's nobody else. There's nothing else. Where would we turn? Where would we go except to you? For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. So there's a lot of unpopular things that go on in the pulpits that turn people away. There was a big movement. Nobody wanted to hear about the blood of Jesus. Nobody wanted to talk about the, cry, the, the cross. Nobody wanted to talk about suffering. Nobody wanted to talk about taking up your cross. People didn't want to hear about uh, the, the physical, I mean, the spiritual side of Christianity. They wanted to get the physical. They wanted prosperity. They wanted, the, they wanted to receive from Jesus but not put anything in to Jesus. People didn't want... And, don't want you to preach on certain things and say certain things because we don't want to offend anybody. Look, you ain't going to get out of here without offending somebody because people are people, and if you try to please everybody, you're going to offend everybody. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that's something Abraham Lincoln said, and I messed it up, but I don't know. But it's still true. It is still true if we worry about offending everybody. Look, just try to love each other, care for each other, and, you know, not doing it intentionally, but if something's said and somebody gets their feelings hurt, you know, I'm so sorry. I hate that that happened. But at the same time, if... Now, this group of people following Jesus that got upset at his preaching and abandoned him were following him because they were receiving... We'll see some of that. So I got to look in a while back at the headline, the number one book titles in Christian bookstores, online, everywhere. The number one selling books, okay? How I Became a Millionaire at 30. I already missed that one. A Spiritual Guide to Unlock the Door of Financial Prosperity. This is a Christian book. Number two. Prosperity, achieving spiritual and financial abundance. Number three, real prosperity, because all that other one wasn't real. This is the real prosperity, creating financial and spiritual abundance. Number four, positive prayers for financial blessings for your prosperity. Number five, secrets to financial prosperity. Number six, these are in Christian bookstores. Number six, created rich. How spiritual attitudes and material means work together to achieve prosperity. I need them to tone that title down a little bit. That's a lot. Number seven. I love this one. The Energy of Money. A Spiritual Guide to Financial and Personal Fulfillment. The energy, you know, the spiritual side of it, the Holy Spirit of God and the energy of this money. And the divine equation for material and financial prosperity. What I'm saying is, I'm not beating up on money. There's nothing wrong with money. You got money, that's good. The Bible says it's the love of money that's the problem. So that's not our issue. Our issue is, in our churches today, we got Christians that are flocking to what they can get out of Jesus. And you, you might get prosperity, and you might get blessed, and there are some passages to that. 
But our books should be how to pray, how to read our Bibles, how to live a Christian life. How to, how to handle the suffering that the world... When bad things happen to people, how do I react? But no, those aren't our books. The, the people are flocking to get the books about how you can prosper me. Nothing's changed. That's what's going on here. They're flocking to Jesus for the food and the miracles. and the stuff. They don't want to hear about the spiritual side. They want the stuff. So, we've got an issue. But people don't just do that with stuff. People, people tend to abuse spiritual things too. I saw this firsthand. I had a family in a church. This was a long time ago. They were using God for a healing. Okay? So, Brother Wayne, you're being judgmental. No, I fell for it. See, the family had been in the community forever, and everybody in the church knew how they were but me. And nobody told me because you don't want to talk bad about anybody, and I'm grateful for that. But I'm running around right in the middle of it, no clue. The, the grandfather got brain cancer, and that, that was horrible. He had a tumor, and it was terrible. And they, all of a sudden, these people that were in my community show up in church, like the whole family. And I'm excited. I'm like, hey, we got this family in the church. And everybody's like, yeah, they, they, they come and go. I was like, well, well, let's see if we can keep them. And, but buddy, they, took, they started speaking a lot. Because, you know, in prayer meeting, I do Thanksgiving, and I do prayer requests, and I do all that. And they're just so thankful, and oh, the Lord, and super spiritual. And I'm just like, this is great. This is wonderful. And so we all start praying, because he's got this brain tumor. And, I mean, buddy, the, he had everybody. We were all praying, praying, praying. And I'm telling you, a miracle occurred. And that man got healed, and that thing shrank. And it went away, and we all celebrated. And when the tumor went away, they went away. And I went, okay. See what God does. I didn't say anything. Visit them, talk to them. Oh, we're just busy. We got stuff to do. Well, about a year later, the tumor comes back. And guess who came back to the church? But the people in the church is like, like many of you, is like, ah, I don't care. You know. We tried that. We've been praying for you. Y'all been doing this for years, but we prayed for them. We put them on the list, and we did. And I went to the man's house, and I talked to him and the family, and I told them, you can't use God. You need to be very careful. And that man went home unsatisfied, the tumor got worse, and he died. And I fully believe it was because they, for years, had been using God for healings and trying to and get super spiritual back and forth. To God says, I'm done. Because no matter what, we've seen people pray to get healed. We've seen that in our church here. And that's great and wonderful. People still die. People still get sick. Things still happen. And we, we, we see people get financially blessed one minute and suffering financially the other. That's the way life is. We live in a fallen creation, all that stuff. But if you don't focus on the spiritual side of the truth of the things of Jesus Christ, you will be most miserable when God takes things away. And God is the same one that gives and taketh away, and blessed be the name of the Lord. So our goal should be, what can I do to do things better for Jesus? What can I do to be a better believer, Christian, follower of Christ, whatever you want to call yourself? It shouldn't be about gain, and that was the crowd. So let's look at chapter 6, verse 67. We'll back up a minute. He had, a, he had a big crowd. Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Do you want to leave me as well? What, do you want to go away? So Jesus, this is tough because it's not popular in the churches today, but that's okay, it doesn't have to be. Jesus didn't command us or tell us or even do things to draw large crowds. If you study your Bible, just about every time he got a large crowd, he said something to run half of them off. Which, as a pastor, if I did that all the time, y'all be like, we need a new pastor. Jesus is a failure in the church today. 
Because if he was pastor in a church and every time he got up to 5,000 and he was back down to 12, we need a new pastor. We got to get a new Messiah. We need a new Jesus. He wasn't worried about all that stuff because Jesus said in the same chapter in John 6, 37, he said that everyone the Father gives me will come unto me. And that's where our minds need to be. If God has added to the church, praise be to the name of God. It, as this church has been growing and seeing some development and stuff, y'all, it ain't me, it ain't you. It's all about Him. It's to His glory and to His credit. If God decides to grow this thing and bust the walls down with people, it's to His glory and to His credit. But if God does, decides a blessed subtraction comes through, we're supposed to be spiritual enough to say, to His glory and to His credit. No one can come to me unless the Father, in verse 44, Jesus said, draws Him. Can I tell you, I have probably witnessed to and tried to bring in like a thousand people into this church. I'm not even exaggerating. And three or four came. And people come to this church... I'm like, how did you hear about us? I just felt led to go. <laughs> you say, Brother Wayne. So Brother Wayne said we don't have to evangelize and we don't have to invite people to church and we don't have to keep handing out his stupid little ink pens. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying we are commanded by Scripture to invite, to love, to minister to, to witness to, and to love people when they come in here. But ultimately, it is... No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. This is the work of the Holy Spirit of God to draw people to salvation. You and I point to Jesus, but he does the saving. You and I can point to Jesus, but the Holy Spirit does the drawing to Jesus. We're going to take whatever God gives us. But today the pressure is on so many of our pastors around the issues that not offend people. And that's what's going on here. Jesus just offended everybody. So we got pressure on us not to offend people. I had a church member say, but preacher, people will not come to our church if you say certain things in the pulpit. And I always thank people for that advice. I'm not ugly about it, but... I had somebody, a pastor confided in me and said, I as the pa pastor will only preach texts of encouragement because I don't want to offend anybody and them leave the church. Now let me tell you something, I, I don't like anybody leaving the church. I hate it. It hurts me more than it does any of you. I hate to see somebody walk away from our church. I don't even want them to see, to go, I don't even want to see them go to another one. <laughs> I want them here. I want to love on them. I want to minister to them. But if God takes somebody and moves them to another church, y'all, we on the same team. If it's a good Bible-believing church, and we, we, we don't have to shun them, and we still love each other, but it breaks my heart. Like, what, what could I have done better? What could I have done to keep you? What could I have done to, to minister to you better? But if I have to dance around this book to keep you here, you might as well go away now. I'm not trying to be ugly, and it's going to break my heart when you go away. But at the same time, I was called by God to preach this book. And if I am preaching the text and not trying to offend you, but letting the Bible offend you, if the Bible offends you, you needed to be offended. Okay? So we, we got that clear. I don't think y'all have had any question about that since day one I walked in here. I tried to make y'all not vote for me the first time I came in here. And y'all voted me in. So I said, we own now. I, I have never sugarcoated a thing with you, okay? But I also have never come from an area of hate or anger or maliciousness towards you. I, this is not a bully pulpit. And I need to say all this because I need to make it clear that this is not a bully pulpit. But it breaks my heart when we have churches today that are dancing around sin and dancing around corruption and dancing around major issues that we need to preach on because it's in the Bible because it might hurt somebody's feelings. Now I have softened. I used to be meaner and I used to be harder on certain subjects. And then I started realizing how things affect families. And I started realizing how it's affecting mine. And I see it in my family and I see it in yours. And what's the point of me beating everybody up over an issue that your heart is already broken about? But I will still say it's sin. 
and I will still bring it to the forefront. And it doesn't matter how people feel about it. I had a preacher come up to me and say, Preacher, if I preached like you, a pastor, I would get fired. And I said, maybe you need to get fired. Because I, here's the thing God called the pastor. I'm not your employee. I'm, I'm not. God called me. You weren't there when I cried. You weren't there when I ran. And whoever that pastor is, and the one that said that to me, guess what? In the end, even if he got everybody in the church to love him and like him, he's still got to stand before God. And we are held to a higher account what we do with this book as we teach it and preach it. And I don't it doesn't bother me to stand before you, but I am terrified to stand before God and He show me where I abuse this. The one major responsibility of every pastor is to be careful what he does with this. One guy came up and told me, I was like, I love the free advice that you get. He said, you'll never make it in a big church. I said, well, I didn't make it in a church. Now, I just turn around, next thing you know, we got 5,000 people up in here. But the truth is, you know, whatever God wants to do. Whatever God wants to do, this is His church, man. This is Jesus' church. This is not some deacon's church. This isn't some little lady's church. This isn't some Sunday school teacher's church. This isn't the pastor's church. This is Jesus' church. And I want Him to be glorified in it. And every and when y'all put me cold and dead in the ground, I want to know that I stood on this word before you. Well, we're going to hurt people's self-esteem. That's something I've heard. You know the problem with that is the prisons are full of people with high self-esteem. I don't think human beings need more self-esteem. We need to be broken. We need to be broken and we need to be humbled before Almighty God. I want to give you one more illustration before I move on or we're going to be here all day. One of my churches, the organist, was sitting over here and playing, and she, um, she decided to leave her family, leave her husband, leave her everybody, children, everybody. She'd been there forever. They'd been married forever. I'm like, what are you doing at this stage in life? She found another man, found everything. I mean, it was crazy. So, meeting with them, she told me, she said, I know it's wrong, but God will just have to forgive me. I said, you don't understand grace. So she goes off, marries this other man, and she joins. She's, we get a letter in the mail wanting her letter from our church. She's in a... We're going to for them now and all this stuff. I mean, the leadership, we said, we ain't granting anything. We're not giving not in good standing with the church and we wrote a letter and I sent it to him and then I got on the phone and I called the pastor of this mega church in Tuscaloosa and I finally got him on the phone and um, I told him the situation I told him she was abandoning her family I told him we were not going to send her letter we were not in good fellowship with her actually we were churching her and you need to know what's going on in that situation that you just brought into your church and this man who had pastored that church for 40 years told me, oh, well, they're a big family in my church, and I don't want to offend them, and I might lose all of them if I... I said, brother, you got to do what you got to do. He'll answer for that. And that woman left her family, and that pastor let her think it was okay, and she had a blessing, and everybody saw her over there. Bless her heart. We just love our new organ player over here. Isn't she great? And it wasn't too long that her husband, her true husband, died. The one she ran off with died. And her daughters told us, said, Mama said it was the worst decision she ever made in her life. And it was sinful and it was wrong. But the sad thing is that pastor didn't stand up and say, Honey, go back to your family. No, he wanted an organist. I'll take a hammer to that daggum piano if that means not letting some sin and debauchery into this church. I would have said, we don't need an organist that bad. We don't want to offend. And guess what? They're all out of the church now. 
but you didn't stand with God on that. Anyway, Paul said, and we're told in the Bible that we should preach the truth in love. So we need to do it in love. But we were doing it in love to save her from herself. That's what we were trying to do. The Bible says in John 3, 27, John the Baptist said, No one can receive a single thing unless it's given him from heaven. So we're not concerned about ten simple ways to grow the church. We're not concerned with ten ways to prosper ourselves. We're concerned with what does God say in his book. All right. John chapter 6, verse 53 through 57. So Jesus said to them, this is what made everybody upset. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in him, in you. So you can see where we got a problem. Whatever feeds on the flesh, whoever, and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks on my blood abides in me, and I in him. And then verse 57. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. All right. Now we say, so that's communion. And that's why we're doing communion. There was no communion at this time, so this, that's not what he's talking about directly, but this is leading up to that. So it's not an idea that if you do communion, you'll be saved and you get to go to heaven. No, the idea is you're doing communion because you're saved. He's using symbolic language. He's using metaphor. And so some people think that they're all upset and mad because he's talking about drinking blood and that's against the law and all this stuff. But really, if you follow this along, he's already talked about that he's the bread of life. That was a metaphor. Nobody said, oh, he's a piece of bread. And he's living water. He said, if you drink this water, you'll get thirsty again. But if you drink this water, you'll never thirst again. If you eat this bread, it's the, you know, so he was all using spiritual, physical things to talk about spiritual things. Doing the same thing here. And most of them got that, knew that. The problem was he put himself on par with God. That's the issue. Remember he said, I am the bread of life. Those I am statements. Over and over. So that's the big issue that's going on here. Jesus is saying, if you want salvation, I'm the only way. John chapter 6, verse 60. Therefore, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Does this offend you? So my question is, same as Jesus here, what does it take to offend us to the point where we walk away from Jesus? What is it that has to be said in the pulpit where we decide, I don't want to do this anymore? I have seen several things do that. I have seen as simple as somebody walked by and didn't shake somebody's hand that they got mad and left church. That's ridiculous. Uh, We've seen this over and over with different things. His followers just saw him feed 5,000. He performed miracles. They all know this is happening, but when he got down to the spiritual meat, they out. See, we don't have what it takes sometimes to absorb the deep spiritual things in the truths of God's Word, so it's easier just to take and walk away from that. But the invitation is the same as always. Well, will you go away also? This is a hard saying. What are we going to do? Why do men go away? Because I can't handle this. Why? If you're going to consume Jesus, metaphorically, if you're going to eat the flesh and drink of the cup, the blood, and you're consuming him, that means you're supposed to partake in him in everything and consume him in every part of you. You're going to be one of those weird Christians, one of those weird Bible-thumping Christians, one of those radical Christians, or you're not truly doing this. Because if you're not willing to consume him and receive him, then you're playing a game. 
And the Bible says you can't serve two masters. You can't. You will despise one, love the other. You can't serve two of them. You have to decide, I am going to consume Jesus, and if I have, He's with me and I'm with Him. That's that whole thing, Jesus receiving Him into your heart, praying to receive Him, surrendering your life to Him, consuming this Word, getting in prayer, soaking up the things of Jesus. If you're living a double life, if you're one way at home and another way at church, if you're one way at work and another way at church, this is not what you're supposed to be. There's whole books been written about radical Christianity. Folks, that's not radical. That's supposed to be normal. It's just how we're supposed to be. But now if somebody gets right with God, we start going, oh, they're radical. No, everybody else is so weak in their faith. It looks like... Every time I run into some young person that's given their life to Christ and they're sold out to Christ, the first thing I think is, I wonder if they're being called into the ministry. But then I had to stop and go, really? They're just doing what everybody's supposed to be doing. I've thought before, maybe somebody missed their calling in God. But no, they didn't miss their calling. They're just walking the walk we're all supposed to walk. Tell you what, some of y'all stayed up too late last night. I don't know what else to do for you. I just hope y'all wake up in time to do communion so you don't fall over up here. It's a hard saying. So everybody left, of course, but in, in verses 66 through 71, the 12 stayed. The 12 stayed. And they don't. They don't care about the food. They don't care about the, we're going to get some kind of blessing out of this physically or anything else. These people are committed to him. Now, of course, when Jesus was crucified, they forsook him and fled because they were terrified. But at this point, they stay. The hard teaching didn't run them off. They know they're not there for sugar-coated messages. They've seen him perform miracles. They know when he says it, he means it, and he accomplishes it. Then in verse 68, Lord... Who will we go to? You have the words of eternal life. So let me ask you, where are you going to go? Something said up here and you get offended and you walk away. Where, where are you going to go? Think about, get to the logical conclusion of that. There's nowhere for you to turn. They could have gone to the Sadducees, but the problem with the Sadducees is they were very liberal theology and they didn't believe in miracles and they didn't believe in a resurrection and they had the philosophy we may eat and drink for tomorrow we die. They going to go to them? There's no resurrection. There's no, no afterlife. What's the point? They going to go to the Pharisees. Alright, we'll go to the Pharisees. They were super legalistic. It wasn't enough to have the commands of God. We're going to add hundreds of commands ourselves to the things of God. We're going to choke out the work of the Holy Spirit. We're going to choke out any joy in your salvation, any joy in any experience with God. They're going to turn to them? They're going to turn to the Essenes. The Essenes are the other group around Israel. They were the mystics of that time. They were the people that uh, were very into the super duper spiritual stuff but also they had walked away from society as a whole and were living off in the woods in Qumran by themselves going y'all can all go to Hades in a, in a hand basket because we're done with y'all you can't do that either you might want to but you're not supposed to so where do you go alright the Greeks are over there let's all run to the Greeks they, they got philosophy We'll go to the philosophers. Let me tell you something about philosophy about life that has no conclusion in Christ. It's just talking in circles. Because there's no conclusion in philosophy if you don't have Christ. You can't go to them. You're going to go to the world? The world hates you. The world wants to destroy you. The world wants to make you miserable. And sin will take you further than you ever wanted to go till it ruins your life. So go to the world. What are you going to get? Go to sin, you just get death. Will you leave as well? So shall we go? You have the words of your life. Do you care about the things of eternal life? You are not going to be here long. But eternity is forever. 
It must have been a ball game. I don't know about something. I don't know. Y'all watch the Olympics too much or something. Y'all just want to sit around and watch men beat up women. I don't know. Verse 35 of chapter 6. I am the bread of life. Jesus told them, no one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. You're only going to be satisfied in Jesus. That's it. I'll tell you this little story. True story. Four-year-old little boy goes to the doctor for a checkup. All right, he's in there in the doctor, and the doctor's trying to get him to smile, get him to talk, and he looks in his ears, and he says, am I going to find Big Bird in your ears? Four-year-old, nothing. Nothing. He goes, and he looks up his nose. He says, am I going to find a cookie monster up your nose? Nothing. Nothing. He takes his stethoscope, and he puts it on his chest. He said, am I going to find Barney in your chest? He said, oh, no. I got Jesus in my heart. I got Barney on my underwear. <laughs> and you say, what about all this stuff, Jesus, in your heart? Well, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7 says that He lives and abides in your heart. Where else are you going to go? There's nobody else. There's nothing else. That's why Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. The world will not give you this. You can sit in the garage, but that don't make you a car. You can come take communion. That doesn't make you a Christian. We're going to do communion. But I want you to be able to understand that when you partake and eat of His flesh and drink of His blood in this symbolic way, you are doing this in remembrance of Him. You are doing this because of the sacrifice that Jesus is and what He did for you. And when you partake in this, you are saying, I'm consuming Him and He is a part of me. Now again, there's no shame. If you need to wait to the end of the service, then I will come to you and I will administer. But if you're able, and physical, physically able, and you want to partake, we want to give you that chance. If you are physically able, but before you do, you need to pray. You need to pray to make sure everything's right between you and God and where you're where you need to be. Father God, during this invitation time, we want to give everybody a chance. If they need to pray at the altar, they need to pray where they are, but they would pray. They would pray to be right with you before they partake in this. Lord, that we would be found worthy. God, if somebody here that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that they would come to know you through this sacrifice you have made. Where else are we going to turn? What else are we going to do? Well, God, if this offends, then it has to offend. But at the same time, Lord, we want to glorify you. We want to lift you up. We want to remember the sacrifice you made. And as you speak to every heart in this place, that when we partake in this, we're partaking with you in Jesus' name. Would you stand with us as the music is playing and is